13, 2016, 7 p.m. Manistee City Council work session it is now called to order. Work session item, public comments uh, uh, on a work session related item. Are there any public comments that anyone would like to bring forward before we start? Discussion on payments in lieu of taxes. Uh, City Manager at that Taylor and Finance Director at Bradford. Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council. We're going to start off with a discussion on pilots. And uh, I'm happy to report that we have uh, Tony Lindy from Traverse City. He's our Housing Commission. Uh, this is one of the things he does is talk about pilots a lot of information so we'll start off with his presentation has a lot of information uh, for council in the audience and then at the end uh, after he's done we'll have Ed Bradford talk about brownfields and tips because that'll be kind of a refresher uh, for most of the council some of the new, newer council members it might be something new so I'll turn it over to Tony thank you so you're mine for the next four hours <laughs> uh, this is a wonderful topic of uh, minutia of municipal finance, known as uh, payment in lieu of taxes. Uh, some call it a pilot, uh, refer to it sometimes as PILT. Neither one is wrong, neither one is right, but I will say pilot throughout the uh, conversation tonight. Mostly because that's how I was trained in another state, and sometimes in Michigan I've learned that um, acronyms sometimes say something, sometimes they just like to spell them out. Um, it just depends on how you were taught the issue. My name is Tony Linty and I'm glad to be here. As it was pointed out earlier, I'm the expert from over 50 miles away. So <laughs> back home, I'm just the local village idiot on affordable housing. So this happens from time to time. I'll go out to communities and talk about payment in lieu of taxes. We developed this workshop back in June because so many municipalities and uh, local units of government were struggling with this issue. So we did it through Networks Northwest, and I brought up the Michigan Housing Council, some attorneys, former attorney, uh, uh, Mishta, who's now in private practice, and some people with some um, funding experience of buying tax credits that often use payment loop taxes in their operations. I'm going to try to talk a lot about um, this in a context that everyone can understand. I want you to interrupt me at any time to say anything you want, ask any kind of question. I want it to be sort of a give and take tonight because I think it's going to be the most productive way to do it. I just came, last night I was out till midnight with the Trevor City City Council. You know, they're having some issues. I think most of you probably follow what's been going on up there about Proposition 3 and tall buildings and, and things like that. That's still an open wound. And um, I just don't want to have that kind of <laughs> event tonight where it's all one-sided talking. This should be a conversation and dialogue. There, you have every right to be concerned about payments in lieu of taxes. You have every right to be critical of developers that walk in here. I am no fan of the way the pilot system works in the state of Michigan, not at all. In my background, I was a uh, gubernatorial appointee to, to, the, to Michigan, and I served for four years. I was a, back then, they were appointing people from around the state to represent certain regions. I represented the west side of the state. Uh, this governor didn't appoint people that way, it's just kind of a general appointment. But I, took my duty seriously to try to advocate for the west side of the state. Obviously, a lot of this policy is set up to go to the east side of the state, you know, the I-75 corridor and all those communities over there. So I would often take issue with a lot of these kind of programs. You, I've seen this too many times in rural Michigan where a developer comes into town, sometimes invited, sometimes not, and <coughs> demands that you guys get married for 50 years <laughs> over a project and they tell you they have to do this because that's what the applications tell them they have to do. That is absolutely true, but it's so unfair that oftentimes municipalities like you have to be the first to technically underwrite a deal and give a pilot before that's even the application is submitted to the state, before you know investment communities have decided to invest in the deal or what have you. So you're often put in a bad position where you have to figure out whether you trust this developer whether you've done enough research uh, on the kind of deal they're proposing and whether it fits into your community. But we're gonna talk about all that. These are real issues 
and I'm very sympathetic to that. So don't think I'm here to tell you that this is always a great deal because some communities have been burned. <coughs> And it's good for you as elected officials to have a little bit of cynicism when you're talking to these folks. And hopefully at the end of this conversation we have tonight, you'll have some tools to talk to them, to negotiate with them, to figure out what's best for your community. Because you are giving something up in tax revenue, you should be getting something back in return. It could be just affordability, it could be a reuse of a problem property. There's a lot of things at play here, and you have to weigh them. So like I said, there is no real simple answer here. Nothing is wrong. Any feeling you have about payment in lieu of taxes is certainly gonna be credible in my mind. Um, this was developed, and I must give them some credit, Michigan Housing Council. This is a small nonprofit, but it's an advocacy group of all the groups, or all the for-profits that are out there building affordable housing with tax credits to Michigan and other federal uh, programs, some of them are national players. I think you guys know WODA. They're out of Ohio, do a lot in rural Michigan. Uh, and Joe Hollander, and the Hollander group uh, out of Kalamazoo, is certainly a regional player, a statewide player, but heavily involved in Northwest Michigan, lower Michigan. Um, that's who I am. I am the executive director of the Traverse City Housing Commission. Full disclosure, I did reach out to the Hollander folks. I talked to uh, Matt. I wanted to give him a heads up that I was doing this because I didn't want him to find out what's Tony doing now because I know Joe and I know Matt. Um, I uh, thought that was important to do. They were fine with that, me being here to talk about payment of taxes. And I know they're trying to negotiate with you and stuff like that. So I want to go to this agenda real quickly and I want to hear if this is exactly what you want to cover or not. Okay. We're going to uh, talk about our outcomes now. You're going to leave here knowing what a pilot is. Uh, you're going to understand how it works in the deal. Uh, we're going to show you a case study of an actual real deal in operation in Traverse City called Carson Square, done by Goodwill Industries. It's on uh, south of Te uh, Traverse City. It's in um, Garfield Township, technically. We're going to talk about connections to other programs and initiatives. Um, we're going to talk about some side issues like municipal service agreements. This is kind of a workaround on uh, one of the application requirements at Michigan for the 9% tax credit. We're going to talk about your perspective on why you should say yes or why you should say no. And I hope that when you guys leave here, you'll be able to explain to your neighbors what we're talking about when we're saying why are you giving a payment in lieu of taxes. Why does this entity get a break and other players do not? Sometimes the answer is that's the law, but sometimes there's a public policy reasons. Then we'll do a little Q&A at the end if we want, but I want this to be um, give and take throughout. Anything to add to this? Yes, please. I just got a question. What brought you here? Anyhow, that. Well, the big speaking fee, of course. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm on that same. <laughs> I, but what are we expected to have something where we're going to need? I do believe you've got some properties that are looking at this as a way to uh, attract uh, state and federal investment. Yes. Okay. Um, I don't know where they're in the stage of coming before your local elected officials, but it's either on its way or it's working sometimes with the planning department, preliminary conversations. Um, and we can talk about that too as we. So you were invited by council? I, I extended the invitation because yeah. uh, council wanted to hear more about pilots, oh, okay. Okay. and we do actually have two existing pilots in the city. Okay. I, uh, I did this workshop in June for North Networks Northwest. We had 60 people. Uh, we had one person in attendance here, and uh, that's how the communication started. That I would, I've gone out to about six different communities to do this. Um, it's part of my, the mission of my organization, the Traverse City Housing Commission. I've been there a year and a half and we changed our mission almost immediately to create or cause to create affordable housing in the region. So I will come out and speak about affordable housing and the tools to do that at any time. On my own time, I'm not being paid for this. I printed my own uh, publications for, and, you know, so you can, don't criticize them because I printed in color. I don't know if you have, sometimes this guy's like, you can't print in color, <laughs> that's too expensive, but I did all that. Um, they did take me out for a brief meal beforehand, and I appreciated that, but that's about it. Right. Yes? Um, 
since you uh, disclosed that you reached out to Joe and Matt before, yeah. before coming here, uh, do you have a business relationship with them or have you had a business relationship with them? None whatsoever. Just in fair open I've known them for years, though. Okay. I used to run a group called CEDAM, Community Economic Development Association of Michigan. It was sort of the nonprofit equivalent of the Michigan Housing Council. It was. Yeah. I, I was a, a lobbying agent at the state level. I was a lobbyist for groups like Habitat for Humanity, Community Development Corporations, Community Action Agencies, all those that rebuilt neighborhoods. I was basically a Michigan watchdog and a HUD watchdog. I did work in D.C. and Lansing. I moved to, tell you full disclosure, I, I moved to Northwest Michigan, Lower uh, Peninsula, Michigan in 2006 to run a winery. And I did that for eight and a half years before taking this job. The winery was owned by affordable housing developers from downstate <laughs> that knew me. Um, they were, it was growing quickly, and I, uh, they couldn't run it on Saturdays anymore from their summer home. And um, I was there to build. We rebuilt their winery itself, and we took an old fruit processing, fruit, fruit processing plant, turned it into a winery, took an old gas station, turned it on, right on the water on Omina Bay in Leland County, and turned it into a, a tasting room and uh, a bar, restaurant and bar. So those were physical projects I got to do, I loved it. But then the economy tanked, so I stayed an extra four years <laughs> and hung out in the driver's studio. Okay. That's how I got here. But I don't have a, I know Joe, I respect Joe a lot, and I'll tell you this about it. When you want to evaluate whether uh, an affordable housing developer is real or not, the fact that Matt, his son, is involved, Joe is not building anything that's junk because he knows he, he had to turn it over to his kids. And uh, he's building some really great work. He's got some deals in Traverse City that I know about. Um, and he just got his pilot re uh, renewed after he refinanced one of them because it had been around and operational for already 20 years, 20 some years. That's about it. Any questions about that? It's a good question. Yes. Question over here. Yep. I, um, I, what are the current pilot programs in the city? Like, where are they? We have two. Um, there's one in Lansing, 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 one in more specifically on the taxes and stuff, but it's property based. So it'll be two properties that you're talking about. So, and you might have applications to do a couple more. All right, let's talk quickly about the need for, for affordability here. Um, Network <coughs> Northwest, for those of you, I think everyone here knows that, right? It used to be the Council on Governments, uh, now they're called Network Northwest. They produce lots of data. I would normally have a counterpart sitting here with me tonight, Sarah Lucas. And she would do the data part, but she's sitting at home in, you know, probably in her nightgown and she's watching a video from the presentation of the University of Michigan students on some projects. So she got the better draw to hang out at home and um, be comfortable. So I'm doing the data part. She would normally be talking about what the real need is to data for affordable housing. Uh, in Northwest Michigan, Lower Peninsula, the annual mean wage, and this is sort of their 10 county region is 39,000 plus. The annual median wage is 31,000. I hope you guys all know the difference between meet and median. It's like the average versus lining everybody up. For example, my household, if you take me and my two little boys, we're six and four, our uh, mean wage is about $30,000. The median is zero, because I got two zeros and, uh, and then my income, but that's the way it works out. You would always set on the median wage from there, and then you would start to work out what the affordable factor would be on that wage based on a third of that going into housing costs. So one third of your income can go for your housing costs before they start worrying about you being at risk of losing your home or spending too much on housing. So that's the affordability factor. Many of you probably already heard that. So that's total living costs. That includes your rent, your utilities, and more and more often, especially in rural communities, transportation costs are thrown in. Utilities are important, especially the farther out you go because of why. What's the biggest cost in the winter? Yeah. Propane, that's right. It's one of the big barriers to affordability in rural communities. So you gotta include that. So if we have, for the median wage earner, the ability to spend $746.75 on rent costs, how many units do you guys know of in your in this area that can do that? You know, take, you think there's a lot of them that do it? Take out the utilities, you take out the transportation, and your rents are around $500? Well, 
I have seven units currently, and they're all all would meet that requirements. Excellent. You've got something going there. Do you do about? Do you take vouchers? How would you take vouchers? Mm -hmm. In those currently <laughs> not, but not because we deny them. Okay. You just don't have any at this point. In, when you're looking at numbers, yeah. we have 1,100 current rental units in right. the city. 37% of them are available for less than $499 a month. That, that doesn't include utilities and, and all that. So you're right there, 500. So that's, you got a number of them. That's they, 37, what's the occupancy 37%. So. What's the occupancy rate of those, that 37%? Are they full? Uh, it's pretty much full. We just yeah. were at a housing commission today and, and uh, in, in our housing commission, they're in the 94, 93%. Uh, and you don't see many rentals advertised in yeah. the paper. So you might have some pressure on there. So that we're going to go to some, uh, uh, we're going to talk about some jobs um, that pay certain things in this region as well. Um, that's sort of the next step. Um, so there are some places to rent for people and this for the median wage earner. And then we're going to talk about what exactly those people do. Your goal is to think about how you want to grow. Okay. Michigan, since I've been, I moved to Michigan in 2000. <coughs> And I think it had uh, negative growth like twice, two times, which is really rare for a state to not have it lost population. But it's been a positive growth factor. The problem has been is that growing as fast as other regions in the country. That's why you keep losing members of Congress. You know, it's sort of like you know, Arizona, Texas, California. And when I was, I did some work in Indiana. We lost members of Congress too because our population was growing, but just not keeping pace with the growth of other areas. So you got to ask yourself: If you are growing, are you growing at an appropriate rate? And if you are growing at sort of that appropriate rate, are the people who are coming in the people you want to be here? That's an important question. We struggle with this in Traverse City a lot. Why do people move to Traverse City? Do you think the number one reason? They're retiring. You know, and so we have a lot of wealthy seniors. That's great, but they make different decisions than people who are um, working there, everyday kind of workers. They're driving up, putting a lot of pressure on our housing costs. Um, you can't even buy a house really for under two hundred thousand dollars anywhere in Traverse City. If you do buy one, it probably needs a hundred thousand dollars worth of rehab. And so then you ask yourself, even if you can afford, if you're a working person, working family, and you can afford a hundred seventy-five thousand dollar house. You get that mortgage, but you're not going to get the mortgage for the extra hundred thousand dollars worth of rehab on that unit because it's technically you're trying to buy a 250, 275 thousand dollar house. Does that make sense? So, Mish to pay for a target market analysis for entire footprint of the um, networks Northwest, and that I did this summary, which you guys now have. Um, I edited it slightly because I was tired of trying to explain some things to people because um, whoever did this, it's proprietary information. They have this formula they use, Mishta likes it, so they allow, the, they, they like the data. But they use the weirdest names ever, like for young singles, they didn't call them young singles, they called them digital dependents. For young families, they called infants and debit cards. Um, Lower income family households, um, you'll see it was called family troopers. <laughs> this is just the old uh, I'm gonna pull that up here before you get a little bit away. Thing, uh, target market analysis. There I am. Manistee County TMA, second one up there. Make it large for me. No. Love you forever. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, it, I apologize for this, but sometimes the PDFs were the easiest way to transport this stuff. But I wanted you to see uh, how this works, and you have the sheets in front of you. You look at the totals at the bottom, 63 people uh, are your annual market demand for owners, 93 people are your annual market demand 
for renters. These are new people at a very conservative estimate who could be moving in to your region, in your community, if there was housing available for them. There is a factor that could include, with a little bit of effort, this could be tripled. So I just want to make sure you understand that. This is a very almost do-nothing kind of thing. You could have this many people coming here uh, in these different categories. What's of note of these numbers that you see here? Low moderate, blue collar boomers. Um, 30 and 10. They make $33,000 a year. 42% are single head of household, so it's mostly married couples. They can afford a 455 rent. But they have a home already that they may be leaving, they're coming here or moving into the region that's worth about $75,000. So they have an asset. They're not, these are not really poor people. Yes, go ahead. The title of this says Manston County. Yes. And the city's roughly a fifth of the county's population. So would you just kind of apply percentages like that to say that the county demand is a little bit rounded off? The city demand can go up 20. If that's the relationship of the, or would you assume that the city, for some reason, would have more of a certain type? Of I would assume this is the rest of the because these are people moving to the region or could come to the region, and they probably attracted to the city. They may live in the county, but there's a reason they're coming here. Well, and let's be honest, they're coming here because of your, <laughs> you're on the lake. <laughs> it's like it's pretty nice, but. Um, yeah, they could live in the county, and there could be a breakup like that way, but for some reason, this is uh, county analysis, and Mishta sort of likes this. This is important data, because when you start talking about uh, a Mishta application for a 9% tax credit deal, there's going to be a huge market analysis done, and they won't fund it unless that market analysis says you can support that deal. Um, and since Mishta's already funded this, this is sort of some preliminary information that can tell you if you can absorb those new units. So that's important to kind of keep in mind. Yes? So with the data we have here, this is showing that we would uh, be approved for funding because we lack affordable housing you could, by you could, 30 people? Or yeah, roughly? Per, per year. Per so if you did nothing, you could be losing this many people not coming to your region, not staying here, whatever it might be. That's how, that's how you should think as people, you know, on public policy, you know. There are a lot of communities that don't want people coming here. <laughs> Why do we have all these empty condominiums? I'm not an expert on condos. Um, but what kind of people are coming here first? I mean, well, you can see this, there's a breakdown right here where these income levels are that could be, could be coming here. Right. So you can always attract wealthy folks because you've got a lot of amenities, same like with Traverse City. And I tell you this, a simple fact, when I talk to builders and I talk to a lot of them, about why are they building condos? Why are you building more and more condos? We have an acute need for affordable housing in Traverse City. And they'll just simply say, you try walking into a bank with an affordable housing unit project. They'll say no. They'll fund you all day long with condos. So even if you're stuck with some empty ones, they know they're gonna eventually sell. Yeah, do they? I don't know, I don't know. You know he may, he, he, right across the bridge. They're not built yet. Yeah, they've been sitting for how many years, and we've got some along the way that are sitting up there. You know, it, it, you, it's important to think about each income level where people are going to live. I talk to folk, communities all the time. Where would be, where would somebody who is a retiring baby boomer live, who just kind of was your average worker? In Traverse City, they're going to have to move away unless they can figure out a way to stay in their house. They might have paid off their house or have a much smaller note on it right now. But that may not be a good answer from elected officials. You know, why, why should you be punished because you've worked your whole life, you know, and all of a sudden now because you go on Social Security and you've got a little bit of a pension maybe coming in, but you can no longer afford the tax break in your community and stuff like that. Is that a, an effective use of municipal resources to figure out a way to find a place for them to live? You know, those are the kind of questions you ask yourselves as elected officials all the time. This indicates to me that you have the ability to do a little bit of work and get some extra people 
moving here almost across all the uh, income levels. The exception of high income seniors, they're hard to capture anyway. That's a, that's a big key right there. It's like, you know, they might have three homes. You know, they might even have one here, I don't know, but they also have them somewhere else. We have that in Traverse City all the time. We have people, you know, who have uh, community, you know, they live in Florida or Arizona and then they're up for the summer months. It just depends what they want to do. So, any questions about this? This will be the basis, and when you look at a, a market analysis for a tax credit deal, whether it's 9% or 4% tax credit through Michigan, it'll be a real thick market analysis that you need to kind of understand. The data is going to be as almost nonsensical as this. Another question back here? I have one. Yeah. I'm just, okay, so a young single is going to move in here. Is there any uh, analysis that has been done as to what job they will hold or where they will get and, jobs? You will hear that from your uh, business community. In Traverse City, we hear all the time from the business community that they can't find employees. And it's a huge issue. It all, almost all pay scale. You know, we had a law, a, law, a law office offer a job to a lawyer, young lawyer from Grand Rapids to move up there, $100,000 job. The guy said, no, I can't find a place for my, I need to live with my family. You know, he's in um, his yeah, life for yeah. But we have, I feel like Nancy has places Slightly different than that's what I was asking. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, that's important because you're going to have to understand your market analysis. Go ahead. Are you guys, are you a couple? This is, no, this is my father. No, your father. I was like, you guys don't interrupt. You should just interrupt her. <laughs> well, I, just, I, I had my hand up. I know. I was just like, I wasn't really interrupting. Okay, go ahead. You know, you keep making reference to Traverse City, and I understand that. That's where your base is. But I also understand that I've spent 32 years of my life in the Traverse City, Leelanau County, yep. the downtown area, State Street, the whole gamut. Was a professional builder for 25 years. Um, the rent in Traverse City is double what it is there right now. Oh, oh yeah, right, right. Double of what it is here right now. The availability for rent is half of what it is in Traverse City, and and the jobs that are offered are paying the same. You know, I mean, yeah. So nurse I, I just, here makes what a nurse in Traverse City makes. Exactly. I would always a cook there. It, it is the same. You know, so. I guess my point being is you just keep going back to Traverse City, and that market has been driven by your tourism and, and your influx of people and, and high income. So I just, you know, I, I don't. The question for you though, do you want to grow here? Do you want more people? Yes. Do you want to do that stuff? Well, and that's there's that's, a long, there's a big difference between Manistee and Traverse. City. I'm not trying to make you become. I want to be very clear. I'm not here to advocate for you to become Traverse City. I'm at. I'm here to talk about whether a couple of projects. It's going to help your community. But you're not going to be able to do these projects unless you do these pilots, which we're going to get to, because they won't fund it unless you do. So that's the question we're here to talk about tonight. You can dispute these numbers, and when you're talking to the developers that come in, they're going to have a market analysis. And you can just you can challenge them on that. You can really say, what does this really say? You know, because you don't want to have an apartment building that's empty. Right. You know? And that's, and that's, and, and they don't want it either, believe me, because they've got people they're borrowing from and investors who are giving them dollars. They're usually corporations that are giving them the investment. They don't play. That's an important thing to remember. Any other questions on this? I don't want to confuse, I don't think these cities are the same, but there are, I, you know, I, I talk in this whole region. I've talked, you know, in North Port of Pilots, I go up to, you know, Point communities and um, Charlotte boy talk about it um, it's a tool sure mindset. and it's okay if your decision is no just make sure it's an intelligent no. you don't want it to be an emotional no like oh this sounds scary this sounds like it's going to be uh, low-income people that are the worst kind of low-income people because we're not talking about that I run a public housing commission I usually serve zero to thirty percent of area median income nine percent tax credit deals they serve 60 to 80 percent of area median income. Okay, so you're getting closer, you know, to that dollar amount we were talking about. For people who are working in the, in the restaurants, uh, in the service economy, your tourism economy, if you have one or something like that. So it's a very different population we're trying to serve. Any other questions? While I'm switching back to my PowerPoint. So we start all over. Okay. Um, 
lower income seniors, 69% are single. They had or had owned a home. And that was the question I asked earlier, where do they go? I don't know if you have an answer to that. That's an important one for a community. To, uh, the people who've been here the longest time, where do they go in the later years? So some of the issues that come up when we're gonna talk about this. Why not let the market address the affordable housing issue? I hear this a lot in communities. Why is it that we just don't let market forces deal with it? Anybody have an answer to that or a guess? We kind of touched on it a little bit. On the invest, how you, how you finance these deals. But quite honestly, there's a thing in economics called market failure. It's sort of an example of when, it doesn't mean it's uh, a disaster by any means, but it just means that demand is not finding a supply. Supply and demand should actually operate in equilibrium at all times. Usually you'll have a provider come into a, in, in this scenario if there's excess demand and they'll provide a supply because they can make money. It's an easy way to make money. When you're talking about affordable housing, the barrier to entry to build is great. So you don't have a lot of people running around saying, I am an affordable housing builder and I've got lots of money and I want to throw it in your community. These are people who are, know how to leverage dollars and resources to come into your community and deliver an investment. That's the real difference. So the market is tweaked a little bit, okay? Sometimes it's called priming the pump, where there's a subsidy involved to get somebody to come in and actually do the work. If you have a demand, you want to meet that demand, nobody's doing it, so you have to recruit them. You have to bring them in. You have to give them a pilot. And in the end, you get affordable housing. You're not going to ever solve the market failure on that, but that's oftentimes what happens. So, yes? No, we, I'm from the planning commission of the city. And they, we've been approached by a developer for the uh, Hotel Chippewa uh, property down here local. It's a big area. Now, he's talking 13 homes that they would like to build in that area, or 11, I'm not sure. That they're not sure on the numbers. But a question when we had the hearing was a person asked, what, what would be the cost of that? And it was said to be $100 a square foot. And the smallest home is 1,400 square feet. So the affordability factor is definitely going to put a whole bunch of people in Manistee out of that project. So how do you get the people to build a home that's affordable for the working man that's making the thirty dollars? With subsidy. There's no other way around it. With in subsidy. fact, you know, you said you're kind of in the construction trades and builder. Yes. That was, you know, uh, that, uh, Northwest Community Action Agency got a grant. They were going to build a single house. They they did this little contest and they got a design from an architectural firm and it was kind of a cool little concept they're going to build it up in their Petoskey area and they put out an RFP for a builder to build one house and they wanted it to come in at $200,000 they're going to put $75,000 worth of subsidy in it which meant there's going to be $75,000 that's not ever comes out it's going to be sold at $125,000 both construction bids came back at $300,000 that but they didn't have it. They needed a hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars subsidy to make this work. Now the, the builders had a legitimate point. They were like, "We're really busy right now, and for us to walk away from work to do this, I would make this much money over here doing you know these high-end homes I've been doing." Now, if we go back to them and say we want you to build fourteen homes, that might be a different. We could probably get it down closer to two hundred, but I doubt we'll ever get it really at two hundred. Those, that's another issue we have in this region. There's just not enough uh, trades that are available in Hungary. You know, we had a downturn in the economy and a lot of people left, found other work or did something else. It's starting to come back, but once again, a lot of them are building high end stuff. Um, why not make employers pay more to employees? This is the one I hear a lot in communities. Why can't we just, you know, this is sort of, you heard this nationally, it's like the $15 you know, an hour uh, minimum wage discussion or higher. It's just not based in reality and economics. In this region, a lot of our economy is based on agriculture and tourism. And those two things, those prices are competing on a statewide or a regional, sometimes even national market. You can't just go out and sell your fruits and vegetables for more because you need to pay your people more because of housing. Nobody, buyers won't buy from you, you know? That's the reality of it. 
Same with tourism. I don't know if Traverse City will be successful as a tourist destination with $30 hamburgers, you know, and some of the restaurants down there. So you can't just go to an employer and say, you gotta pay more so they can buy more house. Um, you know, that just doesn't work. You know, I was working at a winery, and that's, you know, we did, you know, value added, we grew grapes, turned it into bottles of wine. But we sold that wine based on what grocery stores wanted to pay us for that wine, what distributors wanted to pay us for that wine. We couldn't just like start paying more and raise our prices. We would lose shelf space. That's all there is to it. So it's not as easy as it sounds. You say just pay more. It's a, you have to really think about your economy here locally. Uh, are these housing options really needed? I hear this a lot. I've heard this here tonight. Whether you really need more affordable housing or not. Um, that's something for you to have to decide. I can I can always tell you this. If somebody comes in and builds an affordable housing project, they're gonna build really nice units, and it's probably gonna put on pressure on other um, landlords to either upgrade, you know, that's a nice thing as a domino effect, because some people move into these new units, open up some other units, they're gonna have a little bit of churn in the community. That's always kind of a good thing. Other issues that you guys can think of about this? All right, we're gonna start getting into um, a few things. I'm going to come back to this. I'm going to talk about the Mishta Ordinance real quickly. Um, you have that on your sheet. Uh, I gave you the exact language and I want to sh share this with you. This is kind of confusing sometimes to folks. State law allows this only through the Mishta legislation. And it says, if a housing project is financed with federally aided or authority aided Mishta mortgages or advance or grant from the authorities, then except as provided in this section, the housing project is exempt from all ad valorem property taxes imposed by this state or any political subdivision public body taxing district in which the project is located. Okay. So this is basically saying that Michigan is not going to allow a project to come in here under their financing system or HUD financing system and allow you to tax it at that local rate. You're going to have to do that. We're going to talk about how they calculate that in a minute. Okay. Now, a, a municipality by ordinance may establish or change the amount it chooses, the services charged to be paid in lieu of taxes, by all in any class of housing projects except from taxation under this act. However, the service charge shall not exceed the taxes that would be paid for with this act. We're going to talk about that. Now, why would they do that? Okay, this is just public grants and public dollars coming in here. Why wouldn't they allow you to take your full tax bite out of it? This was a big problem when Habitat for Humanity really started up in the you know, mid-90s, they would build a house, give the keys to a family, and they would have a small mortgage, like $80,000. Everything else was done with sweat equity. The value of that house, when the assessors came in, was $180,000, and guess what? The new tax bill came the next year, and that family could no longer support that mortgage and that tax bill at that house. So we had, you know, so, you know, you can imagine this issue. Imagine it with, a 60 or 80 unit apartment complex. You build 10, 15 million dollar project in the community, the local tax assessor shows up and says, this is worth 15 million dollars. You owe me $20,000 a unit or something like that. Divide that up, a you know, thousand, whatever. It's, whatever it's gonna be, you're gonna be underwater immediately, okay? Developers want predict predictability, and that's what the pilot does. You will know for the next 20, 30, or 40 years what your payment is going to be to that municipality. That's the most important thing. The rate is important too, and we're going to talk about that in a second. But the predictability makes their lives a lot more comfortable. It makes their investors' lives a lot more comfortable, and their financial institutions' lives a lot more comfortable. Because they can't afford to have in year three, four, five a change of mind that says, you know what, we want this to be paying full rate of taxes. Then you'll have to throw everyone out who's low income and see if you can 
you know, rent it out another way. Does that make sense? So you might think this is just public dollars, why can't we get a piece? I think that's a good way to think about it because that's one of the problems I have with pilots, but it's basically the state law. And the only way you're allowed to do a pilot is with state or federal dollars through MISHTA. So you can't go and say, XYZ Corporation wants to build a couple of units, let's give them a pilot. You're not gonna be allowed to do that. Yes? The problem with that concept is that the city services have to be provided to those occupants. That's right. And they're not paying for it. They're, they're paying, they're, they're, we're gonna show you the calculation. They're not, you gotta see Sorry. if it's worth. They're it's paying worth. a very small percentage of exactly. it. Exactly. And what's happening is the properties around them are increasing in value because of this nice new development. And these people are paying even more yeah. because they're paying the full rate. And you were identifying a real problem. You, you reach a point where, you know, how much tax base are you giving up? Uh, and what's the increased cost of your services in, in maybe impacting Absolutely. the delivery or, or the type of services you're even able to provide to the community because of of the loss of tactics. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna look at some numbers on this. Go ahead. It's um, a legitimate point. What if a developer comes in and they want they want to put some mixed use in the building? They want some apartments. Yeah. They want some retail. Can you break it down? Can the assessor break it down so that the retail portion, or say maybe the depends on how full it's market funded. rent apartments. What built that part of the building? If it's all done with. 9% tax credit money or you know federal dollars, then you're gonna have trouble with that. The answer is yes, if there is a different source of funding for that piece of the deal. Some apartment complexes are so large, they do have multiple layers of financing in different sources. They might have uh, you know federal home loan bank dollars, they might have loan to housing tax credits, they may have home dollars from the state. They also might have um, a new market tax credit or something like that. All of them have different relationships um, to different programs and would require some sort of pilot. But if they just went out and got a mortgage and just added on their property something that was going to be commercial, you might be able to have a different conversation with them about that. But it may be something you want. You know, I've seen in communities, when I was working in downtown Indianapolis, the very first Starbucks coffee to come into Indianapolis was in a low-income housing tax credit in an old HUD building that was had so many murders in it, HUD shut it down and, and fired the owner, put it up for sale. It became a 9% tax credit. In that building was the very first Starbucks coffee in the city. And they didn't, it wasn't paying the full tax rate. So it was because of the subsidy on that building. But the community got a Starbucks. People seem to like that. Yes, questions? Did somebody ask, did you ask a question? I thought I saw a hand go up, I apologize. It's all about exchange. And I think that's important to remember. What do you get in exchange for this? For what you give. What's that? For what you get, for what you give. Yep. We're not like Mr. or the church or whatever they're asked about the, uh, the money comparison as time goes on. Once you make a commitment, you can change that uh, 4% uh, at when you originally made it. In 10 years you couldn't change because that's they want the fixed income. They want the predictability. So they know how much they're paying for unless the there is a change yeah. in ownership, yeah. unless there's a change in operation, which sometimes happens, then you can renegotiate. But if they're operating it according to the conditions of the contract, they keep it. Um, I have this side uh, uh, sort of presentation that the Michigan Housing Council did, and they talked, you know, this is pretty old, but you know, they talk about how some communities really like the pilot program. You can imagine a community like Detroit or Flint in a while back, Grand Rapids, where nothing was being built. This is a way to stimulate some development, okay? It's much different, and this is the beginning of my conversation with you guys. Municipal finance in rural communities is a lot different. Your tax base is much more precious and fragile you have to be a little more you know intentional about what you want to do i love it when communities are intentional with what they're going the direction they want to go i don't believe in waiting for the market to fix it i tell people all the time communities that get it know that they have to plan to be successful you just can't wing it you can't just hope for the best um, 
we kind of covered this, you know, it's by ordinance. The municipal uh, government can also have its own little local ordinance. You have to be careful, however, you cannot discriminate with your pilot ordinance. You want to say, you know what, we, we want to accept pilots, but only for senior citizens. You can't do that. You're going to have to go get a fair housing claim eventually. Maybe not immediately because, you know, your community is small enough that you might be off the radar of the fair housing groups and stuff like that. But if a developer shows up and says, I want to do regular low income, you say, no, only for seniors, they're going to say, wait a minute. You can't, off, you know, you can't discriminate that way. So just be a little careful if you're going to try to set up a policy um, and work that. How does a pilot work? Um, typical property taxes will be replaced by an alternative payment that's tied to the net rental income. It's total rents collected minus the cost of utilities paid by the development, uh, multiplied by a determined percentage rate, typically 4%, and it's allowable up to 10%. This is important. Um, how do you benefit from it? These are some of the things of people who live in affordable uh, communities, teachers, teachers' aides. Um, the benefits, we're going to talk about that. There's construction jobs, there's operational jobs. These are you may not believe it, and that's fine, but hey, this is the argument. You also, if you really try to target, when I go into communities and I hear about a school system having fewer and fewer students, and I hear about you know young families who are living farther and farther away from that school system, I'm like, you should look at these children as little vouchers and how can you attract them to your community. They're worth 70, what, $300 each. So if you build some housing for people with young families, the school systems should benefit. And this is important, especially if your school system owns property that they're not using. You can ask them, why don't you help partner with us to build some affordable housing? You know, if you can get your land at, land at a deep discount, you're, you're also providing a local subsidy that can help uh, drive down the construction costs at a minimum. Uh, so a 50 unit multi-housing project development has total economic impact of $9.4 million and has supported 115 jobs. That's both uh, during the construction and over the uh, whole life of the pilot or uh, the life of the apartment. At some point, these will need to be refinanced and have some more investment in them. Joe Hollander just did this up in Traverse City. He had a, a property that he had owned for over 25 years, and he's doing another. He did a bunch of rehab on it, and he needed some more an extension of his pilot. Um, a rehab of an existing 50 unit. You guys don't have a lot of uh, what they would call uh, um, preservation deals, because you're talking about more like new construction and stuff like that. It's predictability. We, we kind of went over that. So here it is a simple project. You didn't have a pilot in this, and you have a per unit cost and per month of $525 allowable. You're allowed to take a vacancy rate. Basically, you're going to pretend you're going to operate at 95% occupancy. And those are the numbers you're going to calculate. You take out some operating costs. That's usually for your common areas. If you have a common entrance with a nice little you know, recreation area, that is subtracted out. Minus uh, your loan payments. And you can see you have negative cash flow on a per unit and a per year basis. Multiply that over 50 units, you did not make enough money on your rents to make this work. That's when you're paying your full tax rate. This is where we start to learn why pilots are important. Nobody's gonna build this. Nobody is gonna come into your community and build this. You start looking at it with a 4% pilot and you can start to see the same thing, you have gross potential rent per unit is $6,300 per year, for the whole building is $315,000. You have adjusted rental income of $275,000. This is your calculation of your rent payment, or your pilot payment at 4%. That's what the municipality would get. This, whether that's worth it or not, as you start to bring up about whether you're paying enough for services there, that's a depend, that depends. Now, why is it 4% when the state law said it's supposed to be 10%? Okay? I was just going to ask that exact question. <laughs> this is one of the things that really upsets me. It's, a, it's an anti-rural community rule that Mishta imposes. And I tell it to them in their face all the time. 
Um, that's probably one of the reasons they didn't want me to stay on their board. <laughs> they probably mentioned, we can get somebody better to donate to the other board. If it's 10%, you get to get more money. In Detroit, all day long, you know, and we've heard, and I'm going to say something, if, you know, if I get taped in this plate in Detroit, I'm going to get killed. The municipality wants to do this over and over again without thinking that's fine, okay? They want development. They're willing to let anything happen because they'll take any amount of positive taxes because they've got so much negative tax. You know, they're losing tax base all the time. Anything positive to win. So the qualified allocation plan is implemented every two years, and it's basically how you get the tax credit. It's a scoring system on how you're going to get your the 9% tax credits. Okay? That's the development tool people like Joe Hollander use to invest in these projects. That's how they finance them, how they make them work. Because they can't get just a mortgage on it. So this is just equity that comes in by a corporation. So what they're doing is applying the mission to get tax credits, okay? And every state gets uh, enough tax credits for $1.75. So $1.75 per person in the state is awarded to each state in tax credits. They're allowed to be given out in the application process to the QAP. You get a dollar tax credit awarded to this development deal. They'll go to a syndicator, and a company will buy these, and they'll give you a price of, let's say, 80 cents on the dollar. So they're making money right away, the company is, because they can turn into the federal government. I owe a dollar in taxes, here's my, I paid 80 cents to pay you. They make 20% there, plus they get a little bit of return for net operating investment return for the deal itself. The reason it's 4% is because they're giving you points, you know, in this qualified allocation process to look better than the other deals. I know it's complicated, but if they're trying to choose which deal is better between Manistee and Detroit, and Detroit's giving them, I'm only going to take 4% of it, where is Michigan want to pick? They're going to want to pick 4%. So you get points in your application process for lowering below 10%. What's the problem though is that every developer is saying, give me the 4% deal, I'll pay you 6% municipal service agreement on the side. <laughs> it's still going to equal 10. But for some reason, they think this is acceptable. Mishta does. Treasury is starting to hear about this a little bit, and they're going to probably issue a warning about these in several years. Um, you're going to get 10% out of this deal. You're probably going to award a 4% so Joe Hollander can be competitive, or any developer can be competitive in the funding round. But you're going to get the 4% pilot payment, and then you're going to get a municipal service agreement that's the same calculation for the other 6%. Now, another reason this is not sort of anti-rule in my mind is because the agreement is between the municipality and the development not the school board, the school system, not your library, not your PDA, everyone else kind of cut out. So people are starting to pick up on that too. <laughs> but in the end, you're starting to get, you're gonna get more money than the $11,000, you're gonna get a full 10%. Does that make sense to you guys? You're gonna to have to give them the floor probably so they can be competitive and get those points in the application process. Yeah. But with the municipal service agreement on the side, you're gonna be doing okay. Do they always agree to that on the side though? Uh, I mean, most developers, or? I would argue, if you're going to think about having this deal in your community, if they can't spin off this payment, it's probably too marginal to say yes. Okay, don't repeat I said that to any developer. <laughs> but just think about that, you know, if, they're, if the deal's so thin, with these dollars coming in, they're gonna say, I need this 4% because that's all I have. You should really think about it. And it might be legitimate, okay? They might say, I'm buying this land at a high cost that's causing me a lot of problems. That might be legitimate. But you get to look at the numbers and you get to decide whether this is going to be um, appropriate. With a 4% deal in place, all of a sudden it's cash flow positive and there's a little bit of money coming in. Tony, when you're showing that, okay, so, so we're going to get about 80% of what we would have got in, in ad valorem taxes. If something was there. If, if they it come could be in just an empty property and, forever. That's the other thing. You know what? It's it drawn taxes now. Uh, then, and I'm guessing with what we're talking about, 
probably at about the same rate if it sat and waited for another developer to come. Yeah, that's a legitimate point, but what are now, you, now what the are you other, getting? The yes. other aspect is the multiplier that they use, okay, uh, you're going to create all these jobs over the term of, of the mortgage and such. Um, the Edgewater condominium is being built right across the street from us in, in the North Channel Brewery and, yep. and apartments. Um, commercial financing uh, on that, uh, Brownfield tax increment financing uh, yep, and everything. such. Brownfield's making the school hold for the taxes that yep. they would miss. Um, so it, it would be just like they were getting the, uh, the tax value out of that. One of, the, one of the things the developer found over there was that he couldn't get local contractors because of the scope of the work. Right. In town, they would have to shut down their regular business yep. to, to accommodate that. Uh, and, and if you drive through town, you notice there's no big box places uh, here to buy building materials and stuff. So some of these multipliers are predicated on on some local right. revenue and some that you may or may not get. Yeah, that that we most likely won't get. I agree. I, and I, that's why you can you can debate these numbers with me. They're generic numbers always, but there is some. Happen. And I'm and I'm not here to browbeat you. I truly appreciate you being here. No, I don't mind at all. This is legitimate. These are legitimate concerns because if you don't ask these, I guarantee you your neighbors and your constituents, right. somebody right. will be asking these questions. I'm already here. So <laughs> you've got to you've got to answer what the public policy point is. Whenever you set a public policy, and I've always defined that as the authoritative allocation of resources. Okay, that's what public policy is. You're making decisions, and you're going to set. You know, in an authoritative state, you're setting this as public policy that you want to do a pilot or not, and you've got to be sure you're delivering back to your constituencies something that makes some sense to them. You know, what if this 50 unit in this community X, whatever it might be, was all families? You know, this could be a big deal for a school system. You know, that's mm -hmm. extra revenue for them, not just the taxes they're going to lose on the property, real estate, but each kid is a little voucher, like I said earlier. You know. We have a property that I, I, I wouldn't explain this to the superintendent. Uh, we built it in the 90s. It's only 20 units, all three and four bedrooms. You have to have a family to live there. We did a calculation. We've been putting on school buses every morning almost 30 to 40 kids into the public schools. Conservatively, it's 280 to $300,000 we've been delivering into the school system. From those 20 units, we're trying to convince our school system give me a deal on property because <laughs> it's so rare. <laughs> like I can do another 20 units and you're going to get another 300,000. You know, um, we'll see how this goes. He claims I can't guarantee they're going to go to public schools. They could get, I'm like, have you met poor people? They go, they get on the bus in the front of their house. They're not going to go to the elite academies or anything like that. So it's the kind of conversation you have to have in almost every community when you're trying to do this. So you can start to see this, this matters to the deal. Whether or not you're getting a deal, that's what you've got to decide. High <coughs> school funding. Get effective. You have this, these handouts, by the way, so you can read. I'm trying to run through this so we don't have to spend a lot of time on it. All right. I'm going to go back to my... We're going to show you one more example that's going to be Carson Square Apartments, a real deal in Traverse City. No pilot, the same thing. 36 units. Now, this was done by Goodwill Industries. And it's for formerly homeless adults. It's on South Airport Road near the old Cherryland Mall. Okay? It was behind the Arby's. And the part of the community had no sidewalks. There's a trailer home nearby. Nothing great about this. This was a great investment on that property. Uh, they did a 50-year pilot in Garfield Township for this. I couldn't believe it. I was talking to Chuck Horn, who is the uh, township supervisor. And he's like, they asked for 50. We thought we had to do it. I was like, wow, that's, that was generous. Um, without it, they weren't going to they weren't going to have any prayer of being successful. With that, a 4%, uh, 8,900. Here's the municipal service agreement they did offer them on the side, which helped them make the 50-year deal as well. So these two combined their payment. They went to the, uh, with the uh, municipality with. 
question then came when you're servicing homeless, formerly homeless adults, EMT runs, you know, operationally, you gotta make that, this is a much different population, okay? We've got uh, two pilot programs locally, yep. uh, one in uh, Potter Township, uh, Horizon Point, and the other one in Reese Park Village that Mr. Hollander did. And you know, it would have been interesting to see the figures on those developments and, and one that just expired as, uh, as a payment in lieu of taxes on Cherry Hill, just to see, you know, what the cost was over a period of time and what the contribution was also to see what the real occupancy rate was. Uh, yeah. What the rent How were. successful it was and things like that. You should ask those questions. Yeah, They're some, very Something like that's a lot, a lot easier to see when it's a locally grown yeah. development. And you know what it's, and you know the population it served over time. So there's no like uh, outside developer saying, oh yeah, my apartment in Alpena has been great. You've actually, you know. We've been, seen, we've been shrinking and the township's growing. Yeah, so that, that, that's an important, you can ask all those kinds of questions and ask for numbers and things like that all day long, see what they want to do. You're going to have um, to understand how it was built, the funding mechanism, yeah. okay? There might have been some limitations that could affect how this is going to be. So keep that in mind when you start to ask these developers about their older deals. Um, once again, we're talking about when you add the 4% pilot in, it's going to have positive cash flow for that unit. Now what they do with this cash flow is important. You know, sinking funds, you know, saving a little bit of money for repairs and things like that on those units. That's important because if you, if you try to start them from cash, you're going to end up with sort of like a ghetto kind of because they're not going to have any money to put into their communities and things like that. Uh, those two payments, if you're interested, are 16.5. Total economic impact of this deal. This is the, these are this is more real than the other ones that were like 50 units. These are actual construction numbers and things like that included. Total job support. These are actual jobs who worked on that deal and stuff like that. Spending power. This is where you start thinking about what an apartment residence actually can do for your community. You can argue with these all day long. Or just for conversational purposes. They may not be applicable here. I certainly get that. But having an apartment building usually has some jobs associated with it. I have two properties that I manage. Got a maintenance team of 3.5 people. You know, so you can think of it that way. That's 140 units. 100, yeah, 36 units. Total job supported, economic uh, contribution to the community, operation dollars. Direct on-site jobs, starting to see a little lower thing. Total economic contribution of the operation of Carson Square and Garfield Township. Construction jobs, that was the breakup. So this is where we're gonna start talking about foregone tax revenue. For the people sitting up here, and you can be able, because this is, where, this is gonna be more interesting. Carson Square differential between agro or own taxes, pilot plus MSA, $41,000. 41.5 basically, minus the 16.5 approximately, and you're getting a loss of 24, $25,000. Okay, so you do an annual inflator of that at 2% because your municipal, you know, your your contract on the on the pilot does increase. You're not just going to get that over 25 years. It does increase on some uh, negotiated, but uh, the rents can increase as well. Over 35 years, Garfield Township is losing $1.5 million of foregone tax revenue if the site is developed uh, with rent-restricted affordable housing supported by a pilot, as opposed to the market rate, market rate housing with full ad valorem taxes. They've lost $1.5 million. I would argue, if you saw where this was built, nothing was ever gonna be built on there of this quality. You know, this kind of investment, with everything that you the Garfield Township made them do. They built sidewalks all around their property. There's no sidewalks anywhere else down there. So they're sidewalks to nowhere. But someday they plan on being sidewalks in those neighborhoods, so they have them at least on this property. So they started, they got that at least. So total economic impact from previous slides is $7.9 million. This is why we talk about what's the impact of having an apartment community. And then you've lost 1.5, but you've gained 7.9 whether you think that's too much or not. At least at a minimum, you can concede that maybe it's a push. You, know, you lost 1.5, but there might have been economic impact of these new units, at least of 1.5, but you 
you would have gotten. You can make that argument to just about any taxpayer. This investment is still positive. You guys with me on that? Most people and most developers would argue you're getting a great deal of them coming in here and building a 4% tax credit or a 9% tax credit deal. That's the difference between equity and bonds to the program. Bottom line, despite the 35 year differential between ad valorem taxes and the pilot, there's still some impact when the land is developed. You have to ask yourself, what's the reality of someone else showing up to do it? And when? If the timing is now to grow, what do you gotta decide? Two sides of an argument. That's right. I, I don't dispute you one bit if you wanna be conservative and think someone else might come. I don't believe anyone's going to come and serve the population you might need to serve based on some of the target market analysis that we talked about. Who's going to serve your, you know, your moderate income workforce? You know, is a developer actually going to come here and do that if you don't support them? I mean, that's a legitimate question. You know, you can have people build condos all day long in your community for higher end folks to try to get a few other retirees to have homes here part-time you know then you can start having arguments about Airbnb and when they're renting them out when they're not here and neighbors not being happy about the extra parties and things like that these are all real real life problems that other communities have so think of it that way any other questions about this got a question yeah, go ahead. Um, the question I've got is, how does this relate into zoning? And right. Where these properties should be, could be, are ideally situated? Let me, let me talk about what the state is wanting. Because this is another problem I have with Mishnah. They've got this concept called walkability. And they want everything to be built walkable, but everything in the community. The grocery stores, the, um, the drug pharmacies, drug stores, you know, jobs and things like that. What's the problem with that? That's the most expensive land in any town. <laughs> this is, I just don't get it. So your acquisition costs go up immediately. It used to be the low income housing tax credit was that prime to pump example I talked about. It would be the first deal done on a block. And then other investors would come in and build around it. Now, they want to be the last deal on the block. And it's causing, it's causing a lot of problems, especially in more rural communities. I have a property right down, does anyone know where the uh, Housing Commission is in Traverse City? It's right downtown on State Street, on the river, tower, 10 story building. Right across from Janus Hamburg, that's pretty popular. All right? I walk downtown to restaurants every day to have meetings. I can walk to the city building on the other side of the downtown if I really want to get in shape. I clearly don't walk everywhere. <laughs> My wife would like me to, but I don't. Uh, I even got a walk score of 80 on my property when I put it in there. 80, 95 is great. You know, I'm like, I can't get more downtown than where I am. It's just I don't have the other amenities. And I think the walk score from walkscore.com, for walk, you know, this, this third party people they use, they don't understand water. They don't understand mountains. Because typically what you do in economic development, you take your pinpoint of your map, take your coffee cup, turn it over, draw a circle, out your economic region, you know, what's, what's in your circle. You put a circle around your community, what's a big chunk of it? Water. Water. What's a big chunk of Traverse City or Leonard County? Water. We're getting these low walk scores, and so we're not being competitive, all right? The reason a developer's gonna come here and say, I really wanna do this deal right near downtown because they think they can get some extra points for being walkable in your region so they can get to be competitive in the deal process. I think there's some public policy initiatives that make some sense um, when you're talking about urban areas because you're trying to use existing infrastructure. You don't necessarily wanna be putting everything out in greenfield development. I can certainly understand that. There has to, they have to allow a little flexibility in more rural communities. If you've got a, historic region, for example, and I'm not talking about historic by code, but just something that's a downtown that's been there for a long time, and you're growing, you're going out no matter what, you know? 
you're going to be Chum's Corner is a perfect example of Traverse City. There's a lot of economic activity in Chum's Corner south of Traverse City. I've tried to take some deals there of the land that came out of the land bank from the county. I got a horrible walk score. But it's clear if we built housing apartment complexes there, they would be close to grocery stores, Menards for jobs, pharmacies, a baseball stadium that has a farmer's market every week and has concerts in it every weekend. There's a, that's a nice little activity you could do that, but it's got a little walk score. So we talk about zoning locally, that's where you're deciding where you want to do the deal. So the developer has to deal with that and what the state wants to do. And sometimes those can play. So to keep that in mind. Um, How much reasons does that walkability score really have? How much what? How much weight? A lot. <laughs> really? Okay. Yeah. If you have a low walk score, uh, you don't get funded. The tiebreaker on everything is also walk score. So let's say a rural community is happening. You get 122 points, another deal gets 122 points. They go to walk score for the tiebreaker. They really want to see you really? in urban areas. Yeah. I really, they came back and started arguing with me. And they go, well, Tony, we did the numbers and out of 48 deals, Rural Michigan got 22 of them. And urban areas got the rest. And I go, you're counting deals. Let's talk about, you know, we're talking about 18 unit complexes and 20 unit complexes in rural communities versus 96 unit complexes and 100 unit complexes in urban areas. You're talking about $15 million deals versus two million. You add up their, their 26 deals, they're getting a much better impact than we, we were. So I still fight those things all the time. But you can imagine um, it's, it's conflicting. So zoning is how you control where things go in your own local community. Um, some people use these tax credits, low and high percent tax credits, to redevelop problem properties. You think something that's awkward that no one's going to want, you can say, hey, we can have an apartment complex there. Why not? You know, you get to make that decision. Other areas, you may not want it there. I can understand that too. But you have to make that decision. But you're gonna, the developer's going to push back and say, well, where you want me to be is not, we're not going to ever get funded. So I'm not going to spend $100,000 on my application process. Because you've got to pay for your market analysis. You've got to do all your construction drawings to show, get through your zoning processes for special land use or plan unit developments or whatever you've got to do. Um, to keep this in mind, if you want to have a policy, Mishta will work with you. There are lawyers at Mishta to make sure your, your pilot policy is pretty good or not. So you can do that. It takes them a while. But usually, most communities deal with this as applications come in. And you may want to do that to see how it works on your first one. But then you're like, how do we, what do we say to the second developer, and the third developer, and the fourth developer? If your first developer gets killed, there might not be a second. You might say, you know what, that sounds a little crazy. Um, Traverse City has that reputation with affordable housing developers nationally right now. It's not worth it. Especially when they want you to have an election to see if you can be at 61 feet versus 60 feet. You know, it really is an interesting dilemma we've got going on. Questions, comments? Go ahead. Is the typical pilot take, like, is it 30 or 40 years? Like, how long does it last for? Uh, this is an important question. The program itself is a 15 year program. So, remember the tax credits that a company buys? They're good for 10 years, all right? So it's over 10 years, they're securitized basically, and you get the investment up front, 80 cents on a dollar, what have you, you build your project. For 10 years, they're using these tax credits. Then there's a five-year period of compliance, so it's a 15, okay? Anything goes wrong in those first 15 years, those tax credits have to be paid back. Every dime, which is why they run so well, because that is, disaster for a developer to have to pay back tax credits. We're talking millions and millions of dollars. Generally speaking, if they build something in your community like Carson Square, you're not going to be able to put a for sale on it and get the 15 million, whatever it costs, back to that developer. So these things are really well thought out. They're scrutinized by the investment world. They're really good deals. I can guarantee you that. It's a 9% tax rate deal or a 4% tax rate deal. So keep that in mind, OK? Beyond that, to be competitive and qualified application plan when you're applying to NISHTA, 
people will pledge, I will keep mine affordable for an extra 20 years. And Mishta loves that. Which is why pilots sometimes go for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. The affordability is beyond the In all honesty, I think you're 15. It's a different mechanism if it fails or changes. Okay. 15 is really what you're on the hook for. And you're really not going to have much change in that. Beyond 15, you might be able to, if something goes terribly wrong, you'll be able to renegotiate your deal pretty easily. Because there'll be a new, they will remove that developer, put a new general partner in, and see if they can right the ship or make some changes to what happened. This sounds like complicated stuff, right? It is. You know who makes a lot of money doing this stuff? Accountants and lawyers. I'm not either. Which is why I'm here tonight hanging out with you guys instead of, you know, hmm. at my home with three, my three-car garage, you know, you know, whatever it might be. Yes? What is a typical size deal for pilot, and what is low? What is a small deal? You're not going to be able to have anyone do a 12-unit deal for under 20 economically. 24 to 48, if you're seeing make some sense in rural communities? That's just what your comfort level might be. I understand that you have some opportunities maybe to do um, some mixed income and mixed use in those buildings that might be using the 9% tax credit. That's a benefit, a bonus for you. Because one of the biggest complaints is why can't you do a little bit of market rate in those deals? Well, whenever you do market rate or you're doing Commercial. Sometimes that's taken out of what they call basis for the calculation of the tax credit. So it has to have a different funding mechanism. And it could be a mortgage. It could be just a straight up mortgage that has to be paid. And if it works, it works. If you're going to be right downtown, what I would consider your downtown, I think a lending institution would say, yeah, I'll let you do some market rate. It looks like it's going to be a success. You'll just be paying a mortgage on that. Okay? That makes because it can carry that debt. All right? And we'll talk about the debt ratios and coverage. <coughs> Um, especially on the commercial activity. Now, one of the hard things about real estate development, or I should say, one of the easy things about real estate development versus economic development, and your people work with your DEA can tell you this all day long. You build a house and you put a poor family in it, low income family, and they fail. That's sad, but you put another family in there. You build a business, and put a, you know, you build some sort of white box and put a business in there. And they fail. There's usually not a line of people wanting them in space. You know, that's where the difference between housing development and economic development. And so, whatever the plans may be, you want to see who that tenant is, what kind of agreements you got, what are they going to do, how long they're going to be there. Because the last thing you want is to have successful housing over empty space on the first floor, or you know something that's incompatible. You know, payday lending, check cashing. Not that anyone would do that here. You, know, you can imagine people get desperate when you got a mortgage note, and you got to lease out your space. In some communities, they'll take whatever they can get. Mostly in urban areas. Make some sense? When did the first pilot program go into Trevor City? Like, how many years has it been? Well, I've got one from 74. More recently, you have one from 2000? Got, we just did, Woda just got one and they applied for a tax credit deal near our public library, the depot project. Um, and they're in this round that was October 1. They look kind of competitive, they might get it, but the deal, the uh, pilot was passed in August. So those depot houses by the library and 8th Street, those are a pilot project? Right. Uh, those are Habitat and Core. Okay. Home Stretch is doing some townhomes. Beyond that, to the road, it's going to be a multi-family senior housing project. Uh, some people would say that's not a good use of that space because you know you got a microbrewery there, you got some synergy with some young families there, and the seniors there. But that's what um, they wanted. That's what the landowner wanted. Go ahead. What's the population in Kansas City? Fifteen, sixteen thousand. That's quite a difference. I mean. I actually looked it up and Traverse City itself was very small. Four square miles. Yeah, compared to the, like you're saying, outlying area. That's we are uh, a much different 15, 16,000 person town than anywhere else in the rural. Mm -hmm. I mean, we really are like a 90,000 person 
community economically. The re it's a region. Yeah. A lot of a lot of different kinds of a lot of different pressures. Now, we have good problems. You know, we have lots of jobs that need to be filled. So you know, I don't complain about it. You know, if those are your headaches, those are good headaches. Right? Where do we put? You know, where our workers that could be here? We could grow. You know, exponentially because there's so much. Uh, demand for you know tourism and agriculture and stuff like that. You have too many festivals. Though. <laughs> <laughs> there's a, no, there's a debate. You ever want to have a fun debate? Talk about economic impact of festivals with, with elected officials. <laughs> like, I don't know the answer to that one. Actually, that's beyond my pay grade. But you know, there are communities that would kill for the cherry festival. And there are people in Traverse City who would think it's a waste of time. Does it make money? Yeah. Uh, it, it, you know, yeah. It, it, there's no question about it. You make some money. Yeah. It's uh, along the corridor of the 31 as you uh, approach um, Paris mm -hmm. here. Um, there's certainly uh, a lot of uh, empty, empty retail spaces. Yep. What's, uh, what's the story with that? But, you know, this gets into that debate of the dollar store debate that uh, the tax you know, tribunals have been arguing for years. They've been trying to fix the state. Um, rules on this. These municipal, you know, these um, municipalities that have uh, these big box stores coming to them and saying, we're not paying the operational tax rate. We're going to pay the tax rate if we're an abandoned piece of property. You know, they're trying to fight that because that's what you're going to have if you don't give us a tax bill. You know, we're going to leave. You know. This is legitimate. You know, I used to deal with downtown Indianapolis, Indiana, economic development issues, and we were trying to get grocery stores to come in. We had Kroger's, but they were historic Kroger's, and they were about ready to close a lot of them because they're real small. And we called one of them <coughs> Moscow Kroger because they only had two checkout lines. You know, you got to stand on Saturday mornings and go forever. Two, that's all they had. That's all it could fit was two. And one of this, you know, economic uh, developer from Pittsburgh we hired to help us with some urban projects right downtown in some of the historic neighborhoods, lower income, mixed neighborhoods, historic with higher end income as well, all crammed in together. He told me something I'll never forget. He goes, Kroger opens 10 new stores a year. I said, yeah, that's what they said. He goes, you will always be number 11 on their list. <laughs> you know, you have to have some reality on whether what you think you can attract to reality or not. Right? You, know, well, you know, so if you've got some commercial spaces and things like that that you can throw into some housing projects, just make sure that the plans are real. Well, I think we better bring yeah. it up. Uh, we don't, a little bit off. If we don't have any more questions on nope, that's it. payment in lieu of taxes, we've got another agenda. I, I do uh, have, I gave you guys uh, a chart from uh, Network Northwest that breaks down by occupation that people make mm -hmm. in Northwest Michigan. It's might be useful for you. Okay. So you can look that way. Is that on the website? Yes. Yeah. 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 First, I mean, I'm going to follow, but since he went first, I jumped to the last part of it, and then I'll go through the first part of it. So I want to talk a little bit about the city pilots. Um, Tony may have some insight on some of that as well. I don't have nearly as much information as he does. So, uh, as he mentioned, uh, the pilots were authorized by PA 346 of 1966, which is the State Housing Development Authority Act, and he showed you a little excerpt of that in his presentation. Um, we have uh, an ordinance, Chapter 1489, that addresses low to moderate income housing and, uh, and the pilot. Um, pilots are distributed to local units like property taxes. Um, there's a report that I file with the state once a year on the pilots that we receive. And of that, we receive approximately 30%. And this is in the DDA district. So the DDA would receive that money as opposed to the city? Uh, so let me this is, I'm talking about the pilots that we currently have, none of which are in the DDA list. Okay. Um, city pilot projects, um, the Cherry Hill Apartments, it was approved by council in June of 2001. Um, the pilot payment of, it was negotiated at 13% of shelter rents, um, not less than $29,000 per year. So at a minimum, regardless of what their shelter rents are, we get $29,000 a year. In some years, it's been more than 29. I think the most recent was about 32,000. That started in 12, uh, 31 of 2001, and it expires in 2016. It'll be taxable for the 2017 tax roll. Manistee Place is the most recent pilot product, project that was done. It was approved in February of 2011. 
Um, those pilot payments are 10% of shelter rents. And then there's also, or, I'm sorry, not less than $22,500 per year. Municipal service fee of 2500 and that's adjusted annually by the inflation rate multiplier for uh, a housing index that the Census Bureau um, tracks. That started in July of 2012. It expires in December of 2037, and it'll be taxable for the 2047 tax rate. Why is there ten years difference? I typed one wrong. It's either I think it, I think it was supposed to be twenty forty seven. I'll have to look at that. It's it's one year after it goes off. I think the expiration date is correct, and that should have been twenty thirty. I probably just typed that in wrong. There's not a gap there. It's the year following that. Finally, um, Reeds Park Village that was approved in July of two thousand and one. Again, they have a pilot payment of 10% of shelter rents and not less than $24,137 per year. That started in uh, July 1, 2003, expires 2037 taxable for the 2038 tax fall. Um, the question that might arise is where did those numbers, those not less than numbers, come from? And I um, reviewed the, the records up in the assessment office. Um, I'm not entirely sure where those numbers came from. I, it was a negotiation between the city and the developer, and it may have had some rough approximation of, um, of what taxes might have been, but also to meet, to meet the developer's needs. So those numbers are, um, are, they are what they are, and they were processed through negotiation. Um, in answer to your question, um, Mayor Smith, pilots are not captured by the DDA, to my understanding. So a pilot would not be captured by the DDA, and those would get distributed um, through the formula that the state gives us when we file those annual reports. <coughs> Do you have any idea of what the taxable value of these properties is um, in relationship to what we're receiving? I, I do not, and I've discussed that with the city assessor, and we took the Cherry Hill Apartments, for example. You know, she does, she's not required to put a taxable value on that because it has a pilot. She will once it goes on to the tax rolls. It's quite a bit of work to do that. But is it there is no way. estimate made on those when we build something? I mean, what, what the value of a property is? Not if they're tax exempt. No, we don't do that with any tax exempt property in the city. We don't put a value on the churches. You know, there's an underlying real estate value, but not our property value, land value, but not the, the building itself. Um, in Molly's experience, when these properties do come off the tax roll, they typically immediately will appeal their taxes because typically the buildings are older and they probably um, have you know renovations, maintenance, and things that need to be done. And that that's typically how they do that in her experience. So it, it's difficult to answer the question: Is you know what would this building be paying if it was fully taxable? Those questions are very difficult to answer. So you may have some. Um, some they they would argue they wouldn't yeah. be there. Yeah. You know, so exactly. Like, you know, you're looking at it, what it was when they built it. That's that's your comparison. If, if the property, abandoned property, that's the tax. That's what you're comparing it to. Now, I said that in the presentation. Could something else come along and be built there? That's that's a decision you guys have to decide. You know, what's what's it worth to you? One thing I will comment on this last pilot project that the city did, there, there was the concept of the municipal service fee introduced into that. Um, but you can see that all of the pilots we have are a lot bigger than the 4%. So can you comment a little bit on what might have been driving that at the time? Well, I think 4% got more the competitive thing in recent years. Because okay. when the tax credit program came out, there wasn't competition for it. You know, they were just, you know, there was, we were making sure you had a good deal, but there wasn't 10 people standing for each project. Now there is. So they had to make it more appealing. And that it drove down the price. But I will point out that a lot of the old uh, deals say not less than this amount. And I still think those contracts say that. You get paid whether those apartments are empty or not. You know, you're a, you're a premium payment. Because you can take the property back. You know, this is, it operates almost like a tax on that level. So if, if, if they're not operating the right way and there's empty units, they can't claim they don't have you know, money to pay you. You get paid because you have a contract. So that's that's the information that I put together on, on the various pilot projects in the city. And, uh, hopefully that addresses some of the questions that were raised. Thank you. Um, 
city manager asked me to talk a little bit about the DDA and the, and the BRA. Um, I've got a little more information here on the DDA. The BRA, we had a pretty comprehensive presentation back in May, um, so I kind of shortened that piece of it. But our DDA is authorized by PA 197 of 1975. Um, and really the purpose, or there's lots of purposes for DDA, but some of the primary purposes um, I've got listed here. One is to correct and prevent the deterioration of business districts and to promote economic growth and revitalization. Uh, but also, they can encourage historic preservation and they strengthen existing areas and encourage new private development in the downtown districts of Michigan. Basically, it seeks to stem you know, urban declines because back in the late 70s, there were a lot of downtowns that had really, really suffered. And in the 80s, Manatee's downtown really, really suffered after a lot of the businesses closed. And, uh, it's not coincidental that the city's DDA was implemented around that that's in Chapter 282 of our codified ordinances. Uh, here's a, a map of the area of our DDA. You can see it takes the whole riverfront, um, stretches up to First Street, um, and a little bit across the river. Um, DDAs have to prepare a development plan. Um, that's that's a prerequisite to, to getting it approved, and they may create a tax on the financing plan depending on how they choose to finance. Themselves. The city's DDA does do tax increment financing, but there's also some other options. You can levy a millage up to two mills, you can do special assessments. The DDA owns property, they can lease those out and generate revenue, they can get donations, they can get stipends from the, the parent community. There, there's a variety of ways. But the, city, the city's DDA uses tax increment financing. Let's talk about tax increment financing a little bit. Um, basically, in a nutshell, Tax increment financing captures the incremental growth of local property taxes over a period of time. So at the time a tax increment financing district is established, the taxable values are frozen, any growth in the tax base beyond that is captured by the authority. Um, our city DDA captures all taxes except for school operating, school debt, state education tax, and ISD. And you right, remember um, a few years back the filer DDA had some issues where they had some changeover in their treasurer and they, they captured school taxes for a while they ended up having to pay back and they're not allowed to do that. Um, the base value of our DDA district is a little over $6 million and the current taxable value is just a little bit under $15 million. So captured value of just about $9 million. Um, I will point out that that captured value has declined by almost two and a half million since 2010 and that's with both the economic downturn and also the, the elimination of personal property taxes. Now, they do get some of that back now through the state reimbursement, but that has caused a pretty significant decline in the amount of captured value. Um, currently, that generates about $270,000 a year for the DDA. Here's a breakdown of the taxes that the DDA captures. Um, the city operating tax is um, about 58% of that, 157,000, and if you fill the city refuse mill, it's an additional 4%. So of the, that 270,000, only 62% of that are city taxes. The other ones are the other taxing jurisdictions. So about 32% is uh, other units. And you can see in the other county um, voted millages and the community college are about the same at 10%, and the county operating is about 18%. So if the DDA district were not there, and those taxes just reverted back to the taxing jurisdiction, there'd be approximately um, $100,000, $113,000 that would go back to the taxing jurisdiction that wouldn't be available to fund city priorities in the downtown development district. Um, DDA renewal. Uh, the DDA currently has an outstanding bond that was done for the streetscape, and it's paid off in our fiscal year 2020. It has about $138,000 a year in debt service. The DDA will sunset if nothing is done when the bonds expire in fiscal year 2020, unless that's renewed. Currently, the DDA and city are having conversations about that, um, and that if, if, if there's an agreement, we'll also go into the council approval to renew that DDA factor. A little bit about brownfield redevelopment authorities. Um, again, there's a statute, as most things in municipal finance are, they're authorized by a statute, uh, PA 381 of 1966. Uh, Brownfield redevelopment authorities have a lot of purposes, um, and those purposes have expanded over time, but basically it's to encourage redevelopment of contaminated, blighted, um, and uh, 
obsolete properties. It can help prevent urban sprawl, sprawl because you can force that development back into core communities rather than having it go on green fields. Um, creates jobs, protects the environment by taking care of site contamination, we can remediate that. Helps to improve neighborhoods. And also uses existing infrastructure, which is typically cheaper than extending utilities out again in the green fields. Um, the act basically seeks to attack the problems associated with redevelopment of difficult and contaminated sites, which, um, as Tony talked about in pilots, a lot of times these projects won't happen without that type of financing or incentive, but they're just not economical. So that's what the act was trying to do. City Brownfield was adopted in 2006 via resolution. And again, this is an example of, you know, where would a developer rather go if they were going to do something if they had a choice? And absent any incentives, they're certainly not going to touch the site on the left and they can go up to a green field soon as they go out uh, VRA projects in the city, um, there's uh, seven total. Two of them were county. Um, one of those is expired. Joslin Cove is not inactive anymore. At the time we did that presentation back in May, it was. That's um, been reapproved by the county. And um, I talked to the developer about a month ago, and they're still intending to move forward. They're, they're working through some financing hiccups and stuff, but, but that was what I was told. Um, the biggest one by far is our South Washington Brownfield project, and that's um, active. You can see the construction across the river. So, you know, those, uh, those projects um, were approved by the Brownfield Redevelopment Authority in the city and uh, some of them are moving forward. And obviously, when you do brownfields, you've got partners in that. Um, in, in the case of the South Washington project, the DDA was involved at the MEDC, the DEQ, sometimes the EPA can get involved, um, and then the city, obviously. That's all I had for council tonight. Uh, pretty much I'm going to quick run through what happened since last year. This is our, actually our second annual meeting. And last year we met in June 2015, had good attendance. And we selected top sites of uh, the Joslyn Cove um, that has been restarted by the developer. The Little Caesars property, um, there was um, no response when the owner was contacted to market the property, and since then we found out there's some litigation with the adjoining property. The roadway in, they've renovated that and they're reopened for business. The GT Tire at 305 River Street is now uh, open for, as the auto detailing shop downtown. The Port City uh, Fellowship Church, which is uh, just behind the gas station, I received no response from the owner to participate. Same way with the consumer's vacant parcel on Ashland Street that's located between the same property and the Ironworks building. The Ironworks property, we had received no response from the owner. I have just received a notification from the owner that they are interested in developing that property. So at your stations, you all received a copy of their sheet for us to look at when we discuss our top sites. And that was the same as far as the same 200 River Street property. The four top sites that were selected in had been marketed are 400 River Street and we currently have a purchase agreement on that property and the uh, developer is working through the permitting process. If that does not happen then that would go back on the program. We have 401 River Street which is actually the city drug building. We've had several purchase offers on that. None of them have come to fruition but there has been a lot of interest in that property. 21 Cypress Street, that's the gas station. Um, Larkin Castle is still very interested in having that site marketed. Um, recently, it was, I believe, the Republican headquarters. Um, they have talked, and I've talked to them about the possibility that they have, may have more success if the building is actually tore down to market the property, but there are some t issues with the tanks. That would be a prime location for a brownfield development. And the Hotel Chippewa property, that property has been sold and there is permit approval for development. In 2015, the sites that we had looked at last year, I just wanted to give a run through on some of the things that have happened since that time. The former First Street Tavern is now a Black Dog um, retail building, so that is now back up and going. Uh, the Milwaukee House was sold at a tax sale. There's a new owner there. I don't know what their plans are, but at least it has gone back and hopefully there will be some development at that property. 
Um, the old liquid dust uh, Jen Kemp property was sold to Reese Riley. They're expanding their shipping down there. The former Ringo Tire, the owner currently operates that as a warehouse storage, so the building is not actually vacant, it is still being used. Uh, the former Candy Mountain on Sidden Street, there are new owners. They've been doing some renovations on that property. Um, the former Manistee Cottage Garden, um, they received their special use permit and they are now open and back in business. And then there was five vacant lots on the peninsula that were owned between um, Jeff and Ed Sang, and when they had no response um, to market the other properties, we, that is not included in your list for discussion this year. Typically, properties located within the, within the DBA are easier to develop because there's more opportunities for grant funding. And as we run through the properties, and I want to thank the Planning Commission, we worked on this several months ago, getting um, the list compiled for everybody. And I'm going to just quick run through the properties. We have the old Hotel Northern on Washington Street. We have the um, Miller property, which is the retail and the American Cleaners store that have come up for sale. We have the Riley building, which is adjacent to that. I always like to bundle. bundle. You think I watch American Pickers a lot? I do. So if I have an opportunity to possibly bundle properties for a developer that gives them more room for development, that's always a possibility when properties are adjacent to each other that are potential for redevelopment. We have the former h &K building. We have the Eagles, which is currently up for sale. And then we have the Olson's property. We currently have a developer interested in that. So as far as being a high priority site, because we already have somebody interested in it, it's still on our radar. But with development currently going there, we would not actively market a property that is currently have um, somebody in the process of working on permits. Then we have, um, going north on US 31, we have the uh, former gas station that recently was Jim's Pepper Corn, I think. Just north of that, we have the Spodorsky Oil. And north of that, we have the Lakeview Car Wash. That is another prime example of a good property for bundling by putting all three parcels together. They're actually under control of Slarny Castle. So they, and they would be interested in selling all those properties that are currently uh, available for sale. We have the former state police post. That property is there because it's vacant. The state has expressed no interest in selling the property. Um, then we have the um, property at 302 First Street that's owned by the Slates. That was, used to be like an outlet store for the North Channel outlet. It's across the street from the flower shop on the corner. And the laundromat, that's where that one is located. We have the former Salty Dog Saloon at 1500 Main Street. We have the former Century Boat property, which is the only industrial property with the building that we currently have. <coughs> then um, I did receive an <coughs> um, email from Glenn when he went through his list, who noted that um, West Michigan Bank building is now available because, it's now vacant, I should say, because they've merged with West Shore Bank. So that building is vacant, so I did add it to the list. You have a copy of that also for your consideration. <laughs> that property, I could not find where it's currently for sale. Then I put back the Ironworks property and the vacant Saints property at the end of the peninsula. And then I like to maintain a list of vacant properties. This has been very helpful when I have a developer call that's actually looking for some property for a project doesn't want to necessarily deal with buildings. And because of the fact that we are so built out, it's really interesting to try and identify those properties in the community. As you can see, this Hotel Chipper property was on the list that currently is removed because that is in the process of having development project begin. Uh, the Sands product property here, um, just on the north of the river um, channel, that's a very large property, <coughs> consists of two parcels. That property is not currently for sale. They have property on Adams Street. This is Veterans Oak Grove Drive that runs through here. This happens to be city-owned property here. They have a very large portion of property here that's on Adams Street that is available currently for sale. Um, if you look at the 
when we reviewed for the master plan, we looked and identified um, tax exempt properties, just so we have a list and have the knowledge of how much property the city is tax exempt. And it was noticed that St. Mary's Church owns the property where the church is located and also the property that is north of Monroe Street. Now, this is where the Duffy Fields are and this is where the wells are here. If this property were split, then at that time, it could be marketed for sale because how much is the church going to use a property that's on the opposite side of the street? So that's something we could approach the church with, see if they would be interested or not. Again, they don't like to pay taxes, so I don't know what their interest would or would not be in that. Then we had the former Washington School property. Last year, there was a um, little bit of an issue because it's still, the school still had ownership of lot two since then. That dispute between the property owners, they thought they had bought the whole property, including both parcels. That's been straightened out. It is now all under the ownership of Calamar Investments, and it is listed for sale. And then we have the 55 acres on Cherry and Murphy Road. So then we have the Knott property. This right here to the south of the property is actually where Cherry Hill Apartments is located. And then we have a property right here that is owned by St. Paul's Lutheran Church. And this is the Tamarack Street on the way to the high school, and there is one on the other side of the street. So this, these two properties are very close to the school, and we just had Tony talk about how if you, somebody wanted to put a development close to school, it may be a good um, location because for families because of the proximities to the school. So that's something for consideration. And then we have um, Radio Hill, is what we refer to it here. Currently, uh, Paul Swidorski has been, had a permit for sand mining. That permit expired at the end of December. He, I told him because he has to come back for a renewal. It's the only special use permit the city has that has an expiration. It has a five-year term. Anytime somebody asks for a permit for sand mining and gravel, I've been working with Paul. I'm not shutting down his process because he's got to bring that to the Planning Commission. There is a purchase offer on that property right now, and I'm awaiting receipt of a special use permit for that property, but I need to have that request in conjunction with Paul's request of the Planning Commission is improving one thing one month with a different plan underneath it so that the two projects are working together. So that will probably come before the Planning Commission in February. And then we have, this is where our MCC is. This is the same property that is south of MCC on US 31. Then we have um, Blarney Castle owns, this is where the former Top Notch Marathon Station was. They have since removed that building. So it is now completely a vacant property. So that just makes it more desirable for a developer that is located on US 31. Because it was a gas station, it would most likely qualify for brownfield credits also. We, the city proper owns two lots in the industrial park. They're both lot 12 and lot 13. We have had, I think, in the last four to five months, two different people who have expressed some interest in that property. Nothing has come to the point where it would come back to, you know, move forward with the request. It's been discussed, but those properties, the planning commission, has authorized the city to move forward with the sale of those properties without having to go back to the Planning Commission if a developer comes in and is interested in purchasing those two properties, either separately or together. <coughs> then we have the consumer's property that is where their old um, service center was. They have all the structures have removed the parking lot and means the city does have an agreement with them to use that parking lot kind of provides the overflow parking lot for the um, Arthur Street boat launch. That is a very large property, but it is located right behind the railroad tracks. So actually access to 31 is pretty limited. But if something were to happen and the rail were to be relocated or something of that nature, that would create a very nice large property for development that is right on the water. And then I would like to ask if there's any other properties for consideration that anybody has thought of that was not included in the list that was sent to them. And this is both for city council and board of commission members. 
we had this ahead of time, and I want to thank um, the members from the Brownfield uh, Redevelopment Authority. I have Megan Kemp present, and I also have Jeff Steggy from the DDA. We have Brandon Ball, Barry Lind, Todd Moore, um, well, Jim also supplies, Jim Smith, our mayor, and then we have Tyler, our director of the DDA. Um, Aaron just left. He was on the Historic District Commission and is on the Planning Commission. I have Maureen Berry from the Planning Commission left. We have Bob Swinski, who is our newest commission member here. Uh, Chairman Yoder, I mean, former Chairman Yoder has left. Then I have Mark Hoffman from the Sony Board of Appeals, and I have Glenn Zary. So those are the members from the boards and commissions who are here, along with the members from City Council that are present. So this is time for people to talk. Because my goal to come out of here, we currently are going to use our our three sites that are remaining are the former Glicks building, which is 400 River Street, City Drug, and the mobile station. Those three buildings will stay. We continue to market those. We had a deadline of December 1 to have our three sites in the publication through the state. So those three will remain in that publication. What I would like to do is to probably put maybe five, six sites behind that. We will market them on our website. And then if one of those sites is sold, we'll just start moving them up and moving them through for consideration for the publication next year. Denise, I just want to point out that Adrian Gamelecker has sold. So. Oh, it has? Yeah. Well, let's take that one off the list. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Okay. okay. Isn't that great? You've already got another one down. Okay, um, of, of the uh, missions and committees, and, and, and I know the DDA met in a special session last week and prioritized uh, a, a group. Um, if anyone else is, uh, has done so at this point and would like to express an opinion, I would invite you to do that. Yes, there. I guess I just have a question. Are we going to share with those outside the DEA what our priority list was as part of this discussion? It's totally up to you. Um, I, we can run through the list. I just need to show of hands to kind of determine which mm -hmm. sites were the top sites. But I'm more than happy to. Yeah, what, I, I think what we did uh, in, in the special session was, um, I'm not sure how many members, or seven members were there, six or seven. We, we took the uh, top seven sites, uh, and in, in each of us ranked those sites. Okay. And we added, going crossways, the uh, numeric value of, of the individual member ranking. Uh, and then took the low number as our, our number one um, and continued in that direction until we had it ranked one through seven uh, for, for various properties. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, Barry, but I believe um, the 141, 149 Washington Street was the top priority. No, we had um, 283, 285, and then we added 289. You, you added 289. River Street is the top. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the second? Well, and I think it would also be useful to explain a little bit why that was our top priority. Sure. Go ahead. view that A, combining those two parcels makes it a more likely the implemented project because it's a little bit larger in scale. But it's also the gateway to River Street. Mm -hmm. Right. What we think. And especially that, that entire <coughs> first block of River Street is really not in good shape. Um, so, and also, in, in the streamlined development process, um, it, it flies outside of the historic district. Wow. Um, there, is, there is that. So there's, there's a little more flexibility in uh, maneuverability. Well, I'm, you know, I'm, not, I'm not saying that, that that's, that's a hindrance, but what I'm, what I'm saying is you certainly want to re preserve the character of, of the Riley building. Uh, and, and architectural structures that we have downtown. But since it's outside of that, it, it 
one level of process you don't have to go through in, in the development, um, which makes it a little easier. The third priority was? The second one was the Hotel Northern property. Okay. That kind of goes off the same thing that they were saying about the River Street properties. It's another gateway to downtown. 